One of Benjamin Franklin's famous quotes seems fitting on a 4th of July weekend, especially considering the way a lot of things have been for the past year and a half or so. The quote comes from a letter Franklin wrote near the end of his life to a famous French scientist, Jean-Baptiste Le Roy. Franklin was concerned about Le Roy's health, and he shared some concerns about his own health. Uh, this is one line from the letter. He said, Our new constitution is now established, and everything seems to promise it will be durable. But in this world, nothing is certain except death and taxes. <laughs> nothing is certain except death and taxes. But Paul the Apostle challenged that. Where we are in our study of Philippians, Paul wrote, I am certain of this. And he was not thinking about death nor taxes. The word he used for certain, and the way he used it there, expresses confidence in the fullest sense. A more literal and complete translation would be more like, having been convinced and continually growing more convinced about this. Now, this is the this Paul was referring to. He said, God, who began the good work within you, will continue it until it is finally finished on the day when Jesus returns. It had been about 30 years since Paul had become convinced of that, and his confidence in it continued to grow for the rest of his life. And Paul, having that kind of conviction about that, is beyond amazing. Later in the letter, Paul called himself a Hebrew of the Hebrews and a Pharisee of the Pharisees. His training and his experience got him to the point where he may have known the Old Testament better than anyone in history. And that makes his certainty about the return of Jesus mind-blowing. <clears throat> Let me try to explain. See, the Old Testament holds more than 300 prophecies about the coming Messiah. About 70 years ago, a doctor by the name of Peter Stoner, a math professor from Westmont and Pasadena City Colleges, got 600 students together to try to calculate the mathematic probability of all the prophecies being fulfilled in one person. Now, I am absolutely not a math person. So, Bear with me as I try to work within my limited understanding of probability and all things mathematic. If you have, say, ten poker chips, and you put an X on one and drop them all in a hat, the probability of pulling out the one with the X would be one in ten, and that's about where my understanding ends. And Dr. Peter Stoner's team began by looking at eight prophecies about the Messiah in the Bible. One was how the prophet Micah said the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Now, factoring in the population of the world at that time, Dr. Stoner found the chance of that happening was around one in 300,000. Now, I kind of get those odds, but my brain starts overheating when we extend the math to include eight prophecies, because then the probability goes to 1 to the 17th power. That's like 1 with 17 zeros. Numbers like that don't make much sense to most people. So Dr. Stoner used kind of an interesting illustration. And he said the probability of hitting on something with a probability of 1 in 1 to the 17th power would be like spreading dollar coins two feet deep, all across the state of Texas, and then randomly having someone throw in one marked coin somewhere across the state, and then having one person parachuting in wherever he wants, and then having him close his eyes and bend down and pick up one coin. And Dr. Stoner and his team all came together to say, the probability of him grabbing the marked coin would be 1 to the 17th power. That is the probability of one man fulfilling eight of the kind of prophecies there are about the Messiah in the Bible. 
Well, Dr. Stoner went on to say the probability of one man fulfilling 48 prophecies would be one in one to the 158th power. So, a one with 158 zeros. That's with 48 prophecies. And there are more than 300 in the Bible. And that gets into probabilities that would cause most human brains to explode. The study of mathematical probability didn't begin until the 1600s, so the Apostle Paul wouldn't have really known anything about that part of the story. But it's still mind-boggling to know Paul, of all people, came to believe all the prophecies he knew so well about the Messiah had pointed to Jesus of Nazareth. See, Jesus was immeasurably unlike the Messiah, Savior, Lord, almost every Jew would have had in mind. The thought of Jesus being that Messiah was so absurd, Paul once led squads of Jewish leaders who went out of their way to silence and even kill people who believe Jesus is the one. Again, there likely wasn't anyone who knew more about the Messiah than Paul did. But coming to know Jesus and learning he is the Messiah turned Paul's world completely upside down. See, there is an immeasurable difference between knowing about Jesus and knowing Jesus. And the more Paul knew Jesus, the more he wanted to know. And even though it had been 30 years since he first got to know Jesus, later in this letter, Paul wrote, I want to know him. I want to keep getting to know him. Would have been more literal. And he said, I want to keep getting to know Jesus inside and out. And Paul wanted that for everyone, including us. And he said, I want that because I am certain that God, who began the good work in you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Jesus returns. Now, pause for a few moments. Uh, maybe draw a few deep breaths. If you need to, slow your thoughts down. If you know Jesus, think about what Paul was so certain about. God is working in you. Oh, you can't hear any power saws or nail guns, and you may not even be able to feel anything, but Paul was convinced he's at work. And sometimes... That's disturbingly easy to forget, that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work. In his book, Nearing Home, Billy Graham wrote about a time his wife, Ruth, was driving through a remote part of North Carolina, and she hit a long stretch of road construction. And when she got to the end of it, a sign said, End of construction. Thank you for your patience. When she told Billy about it later that night, she smiled and said she wanted that on her tombstone. And that's what they put. <laughs> End of construction. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> it wouldn't be a bad idea to picture everyone we see with an under construction sign on them. And when it comes to Christians, it isn't just any work going on. Paul said, it's good work. And the word he used was the Greek equivalent of the word that appeared repeatedly in the opening lines of Genesis. And God saw that it was good. And in Philippians 1.6, we're talking about something God calls good. So if you believe Jesus is who he said he is, What's going on inside you is good, and that's God's definition of good. Now, God's definition always has a hint of eternity in it. 
What God's working on doesn't just have a lifetime guarantee. It has a forever and ever amen guarantee. That's what Paul was getting at when he said, God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work. Other Bible versions say God will continue to perfect and complete what he has begun. God will stay with you to complete the job. God will keep at it, and God will carry it on to completion. Now, the promise is about the inner work, because we all know what the outer part is going through and becoming. The promise is about the inner work, so that we can continue the outer work God has for us. And eternal life is about more than getting into heaven with God when we die. Eternal life includes having God in us here and now. You see that later in the letter when Paul encouraged followers of Jesus to continue to work out your salvation. This version adds, that is, cultivate it, bring it to full effect, actively pursue spiritual maturity with awe-inspired fear and trembling, using serious caution and critical self-evaluation to avoid anything that might offend God or discredit the name of Jesus. Continue to work out your salvation. All through history, people and religions have twisted that verse to create a picture of God as some kind of a divine judge who holds a balance or a scale, and on one side is like the good stuff they do, and on the other hand is like the bad stuff, and to them, Salvation is about getting and keeping the scales tilted in their favor. They know this verse as work for your salvation. Now, you can see why they also misunderstand the next part of the verse, where it says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. They may not recognize it this way, but they see God as some kind of a grumpy foreman with anger issues. And the trembling comes because they're never sure if they've done enough good things to tilt the scales in their favor and to calm God down. It's like they think they need to keep their spiritual or moral resume updated so they have one to hand in when they get to heaven. Uh, they're also afraid the last bad thing they did may have knocked them off the salvation list again. See, any understanding that the verse says work for your salvation is dangerously wrong. It's more like work from your salvation. The uh, Bible version we saw earlier says cultivate your salvation. Others have it work out your salvation. Again, not work for, but work out. It's like the South Bay Coastal Bike Trek that I've heard so much about. If you're going to do something like that bike trek, it's always a good idea to start hitting the gym to get ready, especially to work out your legs. Work out your salvation. Makes me think of the way the Message Bible has this from Paul. He said, exercise daily in God. No spiritual flabbiness, please. Workouts in the gymnasium are useful, but... A disciplined life in God is far more so. Bottom line, we are to put our salvation into action. Uh, the Phillips translation says we are to work out the salvation God has given us with a proper sense of awe and responsibility. Uh, many Bibles have fear where that one has awe. But think of the emotion you might have standing on the edge of the Grand Canyon. I mean, there could be fear if you were to think too long about maybe losing your footing and what might happen if you were to slip and fall down one of those cliffs. But this is more like the sense of, whoa, this is amazing as you look out over it. That kind of awe, fear, even reverence. 
work out the salvation God has given us with a proper sense of awe. Wouldn't you think we wouldn't have to be told and reminded to be in awe that God saved us? Sometimes we can be such a pitiful species. This may sound weird or overly simplistic, but this week I told myself I'm going to try to start every day by going straight to the mirror, looking at myself and saying, I am saved by the creator of the universe. And then get my day started. Get my day started started, because it says a proper sense of awe and responsibility. Uh, many versions have the word trembling there, but we're not to think about someone like cowering in a corner. Uh, one Bible dictionary says the word described the anxiety of one who distrusts his ability to completely meet all the requirements, but does his utmost to fulfill his duty. That's a mouthful, and that's heavy, but think about it. The anxiety of one who distrusts his ability to completely meet all the requirements, but does his utmost to fulfill his duty. And that gets into the third of three distinct ways the Bible refers to salvation. It tells us Christians, Christians, more effectively in 2021, Christians have been saved from the penalty of sin. We will be saved from the presence of sin. And we are being saved from the power of sin. Now, those are some things to think or talk about over coffee over the next day or two. But Paul often referred to his salvation as the point in his life when he surrendered to God. That was a past event. Paul had been one of the most religious people in history who built his life on doing all kinds of religious things and doing them as close to perfectly as he possibly could. Well, along the way, he began to realize that as a sinner, there was no way he could ever hope to do enough to tilt the good side of the scale in his favor. And he cried out for the grace and mercy of God. And when he did that, God saved him. A more formal church word for that form of it is justification. And Paul also spoke about salvation in a future sense. That'll be the day when we trade in these bodies for what the Bible calls resurrected bodies. Eyes will blink shut and open to see heaven and the one who made it. And heaven will be like a gateway to the new earth. A formal church word for salvation in that sense is glorification. So that's salvation past and salvation future. The sense Paul is driving home in the portion we're in today is like salvation present. That's the reality that while we are saved, and that is unshakably secure, we are always under construction. The more formal word for that is sanctification, and that is at the heart of what Paul wrote. God is working in you, giving you, note the two things, the desire to obey him and the power to do what pleases him. And many English Bibles have that last phrase, do God's will. Now, I wish I had the time to break this down more, but the more literal translation is the power to do what pleases God. Now, my favorite translation of the Bible says God is working in us to give us the want to and the can do when it comes to things that please God. And notice the two-way relationship here. God gets a lot of pleasure out of working in us and working with us and working through us and even working on us. And that is such a 
good thing, because we all need a lot of work. Some of us more than others. Now, put... Now, put today's two core verses together. God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Jesus returns. Work out the salvation God has given you with a proper sense of awe and responsibility. <laughs> Not that I think of it, I wish I would have bought under construction t-shirts for everyone. I think we could all use a reminder of that miracle. And thinking about it as a miracle reminds me of a pastor I read about who asked his people if they still believed in miracles. And if they did, he asked them to share some stories. And this is what one man wrote. He said, Pastor, tonight I read with interest your request for stories of miracles. Oh, I believe God is still in the miracle business. Many are still spectacular, but most don't seem to me to be instantaneous. We really are the immediate gratification generation. I think we read the New Testament and wonder why we don't see God performing instantaneous answers to prayer framed with peals of thunder and bolts of lightning. I think he does give spectacular answers, only in his time. I base this on my own experience. If I had asked a close friend 25 years ago to write down a description of me and then did the same today, here is the conclusion you would come to once you read them. These are two distinctly different people with very little in common. What happened? Nothing short of a miracle. A series of miracles. I won't go into all the circumstances, but 25 years ago, I was at the end of my emotional and spiritual rope. And one day, I got down on my knees and told God to either change me or take me home. Because I didn't want to live another minute if my life was going to be the same as it had been. That's when I started to hear the faint sounds of hammering and sawing inside. That's my favorite line. That's when I started to hear the faint sounds of hammering and sawing inside. Well, to jump to the end of the story, over the last 25 years, God has created a whole new person inside this one. That's not visible to most folks, and it wasn't in the twinkling of an eye. But it is a miracle, it is spectacular, and it is not over yet. What God has done in my life is more miraculous than if he had grown a new arm or leg to replace an amputated one because he has grown a whole new person. <laughs> That's pretty spectacular. Our verses again. God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Jesus returns. So work out the salvation God has given you with a proper sense of awe and responsibility.